Galeazzo Maria Sforza was a bad, bad man. All the Sforzas kind of were, for that matter. Galeazzo was the second Duke of Milan for the Sforza family, a family that tended to be pretty ruthless. He'd shame his rivals and would commit weird rituals to publicly humiliate people. He was a degenerate gambler who also happened to be one of history's biggest tennis buffs. He was a man of contradictions, a man who loved hurting people as much as he loved art and music. In the end, people in Milan got so fed up with Sforza that he was killed in one of the craziest ways possible. This is the story of one of Italy's cruelest leaders. A bad reputation. Galeazzo's Sforza behaved in a way that was pretty typical of a spoiled kid who was raised by Duke. I guess that that spoiled kid was also a psychopath. He seemed to love reveling in the suffering of others. He had a lot of power as the Duke of Milan in the mid-1400s and went to extraordinary lengths to see just how much he could abuse that power. One of the most infamous stories about Sforza is how he allegedly buried someone alive. The unfortunate victim was a young man named Pietro Drago. According to some accounts, Galeazzo ordered Drago to be buried alive because he didn't like something Drago did or said. Now, it's not certain what exactly that was, but as we'll see, it could have been anything from a sideways glance that the Duke didn't like to a full-blown coup attempt. Maybe he was jealous of Drago's nice hands. You know, the Duke had a thing for hands, his own hands in particular. He was known to wear gloves all the time, indoors or outdoors, so he could keep them in pristine condition. A lot of times he took off his gloves to admire his digits for what seemed like hours. Before he had Drago buried alive, he reportedly removed his hands. Ooh. It didn't end there. There's another story of a hunter who'd caught a rabbit on Galeazzo's property, an offense similar to poaching. But instead of simply reprimanding the hunter or slapping him with a fine, Galeazzo instead forced the hunter to swallow the rabbit whole. I'm talking skin, fur, all of it. The hunter couldn't quite handle the forced meal and wound up suffocating. Brutal. Galeazzo also was quite superstitious and, like a lot of people in the 1400s, believed in astrological predictions and omens. When an astrologer priest predicted the date of his death, Galeazzo ordered the priest to be walled up alive in a room with no food or water. It was the last prediction the astrologer priest ever made. The Rise of a Wicked Monster in order to become Duke, Galeazzo allegedly did things even worse than starving people in boarded up rooms and burying them alive. He was accused by many of poisoning his own mother, so he alone could control Milan. When he was 21, Galeazzo was in France helping out King Louis XI fight against Charles I of Burgundy. A year later, in 1466, Galeazzo's father, Francesco Sforza, died. His mother, Bianca Maria Visconti, called him back to Milan to figure out what the next move would be. It is said that Galeazzo had to assume a false identity in order to travel back to Italy from France because one of the Sforza's family's rivals had it out for the Sforza heir and tried to put out a hit on him while traveling back to Milan. When he finally made it back to Milan, the young Galeazzo found out that his mother was acting as his regent despite the fact that he was 22 years old. This didn't sit right with Galeazzo. Bianca Maria Visconti came from a pretty noble family herself. The Viscontis were the ruling family before the Sforzfas came to power, so there might have been some political maneuvering behind the decision to make her regent. As time passed, though, Galeazzo forced his mother to the sidelines and eventually pushed her out of Milan altogether. His mother moved to Cremona, a city that was given to her as part of her marriage to her husband. From there, it's said that she continued to play the part of the politician and had diplomatic ties to Ferdinand I of Naples, who was looking to overthrow Galeazzo and take Milan for himself. What we don't know is how much Galeazzo himself knew about this budding alliance, but based on what happened next, maybe he smelled treachery in the air. Despite all this tension and political maneuvering, Bianca Maria decided to go to Galeazzo's wedding. On May 9, 1468, he married Bona of Savoy, a strategic move between the Sforza and Savoy families. After the ceremony, Bianca Maria was traveling back to Cremona with her daughter when she came down with a mysterious illness and died. Suspicions that Galeazzo might have had a hand in the death of his mother immediately started to make the rounds among the Milanese nobility. Galeazzo was now the sole ruler of Milan, but his reputation was tarnished and it definitely wouldn't get any better. Persecution But let's get back to Galeazzo's vices. Let's just say he was a vicious creep. 
his true dark color surfaced time and time again. One of those times was his brutal and bigoted policy towards the Milanese, the Romani, and Jews. Almost as soon as he became the Duke of Milan, Galeazzo issued an edict ordering all Romani people to leave his dominion and leave quickly. He gave them just three or four days to get out of Milan. A mass exodus resulted. It wasn't just Galeazzo who was anti-Romani. There was a broader pattern of discrimination and persecution against the nomadic people. Galeazzo also enacted policies that segregated the Jewish population in Milan. One of these policies required that Jewish residents wear a yellow circle type of badge on their clothes. A dark foreshadowing of things to come a couple of hundred years later when a guy with a strange stash came and rose to power in Germany. Gambling away his empire. Galeazzo had an intense love of tennis, and he liked to gamble, and sometimes these two passions came together in strange and disastrous ways. The Duke of Milan was one of the world's first tennis ambassadors. He almost single-handedly helped popularize the sport in Milan, and eventually built one of the most expensive tennis courts in the world, the Sala della Bala, right in his own castle. He would invite all the best tennis pros over to play each other, while he and other influential dukes and noblemen watched and schmoozed, and of course, gambled on the outcomes. His love of tennis was so intense that he'd often get into fistfights with other nobles, either while playing against them or while watching other people play. Galeazzo's love for gambling was pretty disastrous for the Dutch of Milan as a whole. It got to the point where the finances of the entire city were affected. To maintain his habit, the Duke resorted to levying heavy taxes on the population. He confiscated people's property for trivial reasons. He extorted money from people under threat of taking their property. This would all come back to bite him. The more people he extorted or stole money from or taxed unfairly, the more enemies he made, enemies who would be significantly better off if the Duke was dead. Patron of the Arts Yet, despite his wicked way of living, Galeazzo Sforza loved a good play, poem, or sculpture. He was a huge patron of the arts, a guy responsible for helping spur on the Italian Renaissance. He even collaborated with a very young Leonardo da Vinci. Galeazzo Maria Sforza actively supported all kinds of arts during his rule. Painters, sculptors, writers, musicians. He threw money and stage time at anyone he thought had talent. He saw the importance of fostering cultural development in Milan and used his wealth and power to attract talent to his court. As a result, the art scene flourished in Milan during his rule. Galeazzo's court in Milan was known for its extravagant musical festivities. These events featured grand performances that were accompanied by elaborate sets and stage machines designed by big-name artists, including the still young but already famous Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci was playing around with all kinds of contraptions that could be used in theater production. He designed machines that could lift actors into the air with ropes and pulleys to make it look like they were angels or mythical creatures. Da Vinci was also fascinated by the use of water as a power source. He designed water-based systems that could create movement and special effects on the stage. They do things like raise and lower platforms, create rain effects, or simulate waves. Leonardo also created trap doors and concealed compartments in the stage floor, and even designed rotating stages that could spin around and reveal different scenes and settings. Oh, and he cooked up mechanical animals to use on set as well. During his rule, Galeazzo's court chapel, known as the Sforza Chapel, grew into one of the most famous and historically significant musical ensembles in Europe. The chapel drew in some of the most talented composers and musicians of the time. Some of these composers were Alexander Agricola, Johann Martini, Loise Comperre, and Gaspar van Weerbeck, among others. They created music that was sung by choirs or soloists who would come from all over Europe to perform in the chapel's elaborate space, a space decked out with tapestries and stained glass, and plenty of wine and good food. Even after his death, the art scene that Sforza helped cultivate would live on. The Milanese art and music renaissance eventually spread to the rest of Europe. Killer in Milan By Christmas of 1476, three people in particular had had enough of Galeazzo and planned to make sure that he didn't see the new year. These three were Carlo Visconti, Girolamo Ozzanti and Giovanni Andrea Lapudani. Each of them had their own motives for wanting to eliminate the Duke, and it was planned on the day after Christmas within the walls of the Santo Stefano Church in Milan. Carlo Visconti had perhaps one of the most valid reasons to take out the Duke. He held a grudge against Galeazzo Sforza because the Duke had done very bad things to Visconti's sister. The Duke did very bad things to quite a few people, in fact. Rumors were flying all over Milan about Galeazzo's many mistresses and pretty despicable ways in which he treated them. 
Girolamo Ojanti had more political motives. He was a Republican who opposed Galeazzo's autocratic rule. He wanted Milan to be a republic, and the Duke was preventing that. Giovanni Andrea Lapunani was upset at Galeazzo because he lost his land in one of those gambling debt fuel moves the Duke had made. Oh yeah, and Galeazzo reported he slept with his wife. Together, they met in secret over the course of some months to plan their hit. The day after Christmas was the feast day of St. Stephen, the patron saint of the Santo Stefano Church. Now, despite warnings that something nasty was wafting through the air, Galeazzo left his castle and headed over to the church for the festivities. The Duke was still a sucker for a good choral performance. When Galeazzo arrived at the church for mass, he was met by Giovanni Andrea Lapunani. Lapunani knelt before the Duke and apparently said something to him. The scene quickly became very much like the hit on Julius Caesar. Now, Galeazzo was getting beat by three men and one of their servants who were all holding knives. Before he passed, the Duke of Milan reportedly whispered the words, I am dead. And he was. In the aftermath, La Punani and Visconti's lives were ended, but Ojanti managed to escape. He was captured soon afterwards, though, and just before he was sentenced to death, he gave a full confession. He admitted that the three had been working for a writer and humanist named Colam Montano, who had been holding a grudge against the Duke after he was publicly punished for writing a satire about this forceful family. Galeazzo might not have been a great leader, but he was great at making enemies. He was just 32 when he passed. Thanks for watching. What other Italian nobles do you want to learn about? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.